Hello everyone, this is Jim Lucy, Editor-in-Chief for Electrical Wholesale and Electrical Marketing with episode number 93 of the Today's Electrical Economy podcast series sponsored by Champion Fiberglass. Champion began producing epoxy fiberglass conduit fittings in 1988 and in 1989 developed the first conduit from epoxy resins that had flame resistance and low smoke characteristics. This met the most stringent codes and specifications. Episode 93 will take a look at the electrical stocks, winners and losers in the first quarter of 2024. We'll also check out the new look for G after its spinoff of its aerospace and power divisions. We'll also provide updates for five key weekly economic indicators, the initial unemployment claims at the state level, rail freight car traffic, the Perker Hughes rig count, oil prices and copper prices. Our thanks again to Champion Firebus for sponsoring the today's Electrical Economy Podcast Series for 2024. The week ending March of 30, the advance figure for seasonally adjusted initial unemployment claims was 221,000. That's an increase of 9,000 from the previous week's revised level. The U.S. unemployment rate in for March dropped to 3.8%. Two states had some pretty big drops in their unemployment claims, Texas and Missouri. Texas unemployment claims dropped 3,277, now standing at 13,767. Missouri's claims dropped 2,476. Their claims now stand at 2,975. The other top five states in drops in unemployment claims were Georgia, down 1,103 to 3,344. Arkansas, down 525 to 1,031. And North Carolina, now standing at 2,590 after a drop of 482 claims. Six states had claims of over 1,000. That's a fairly significant increase from our last report. These claims, these states are California, which was up 2,528 claims, now standing at 43,418. Pennsylvania up 1,898, and that is to 11,396. Iowa saw its claims increase from 1,494 to 3,021. Illinois up 1,242 to 9,510. Wisconsin now standing 5,609, up 1,180, and the state of Ohio up to 6,107, and that is up 1,064 claims. One of the more interesting leading economic indicators for the overall U.S. economy is freight rail traffic. It's a measure of the amount of raw materials and finished goods being shipped by rail. The best source for this data is the American Association of Railroads, or AAR. It publishes this data weekly at www.aar.org. The most recent data shows that total U.S. weekly rail traffic was 472,651 carloads and rental motor units. That's up 3.2% compared with the same week last year. Total combined U.S. traffic for the first 13 weeks of 2024 was 6,042,474 carloads and rental motor units. That is an increase of 2.5% compared to last year. Dr. Rand Gahad, the chief economist for the American Association of Railroads, said this about the data. Large swaths of rail traffic reflect broader economic changes, he said. The recent announcement by the Institute for Supply Management that its manufacturing sentiment turned positive in March aligns with rail car loads, excluding coal, that showed a healthy 2.9% growth. This growth was driven largely by chemicals, petroleum products, and autos, which are critical components of our economy. Conversely, coal biomes continue to decline due to ongoing shifts in electricity generation markets. Intramodal traffic was again a bright spot in March, reflecting stable consumer spending, increasing port activity, and a reduction in inventory destocking. We saw some pretty nice increases in this week's data in a wide variety of freight types. Total intramodal units were up 9.1%. Petroleum and petroleum products were up 7.7% compared to last year. That's followed followed by an increase of 4.5% compared to last year in chemicals and a 3.5% increase in motor vehicles and parts. The biggest declines were in coal, which is down 14.1%, as previously mentioned, and non-metallic minerals down 9.3%. If you track the oil market, you're probably familiar with the Baker Hughes rig count, which tracks the oil and gas rigs that are operating. This data is available by state, by basin, and nationally at www.rigcount.bakerhughes.com. This slide gives you an idea of the largest oil and gas deposits. It really gives you a good sense of just how many of the large oil plays are in Texas and Oklahoma and parts of New Mexico. It also shows you how big an area the Marcellus gas region covers in parts of Pennsylvania, Ohio, and West Virginia. 
There's another drop in the Bickerhoo's rig count from the recent data. There was an overall drop of three rigs and a drop of four rigs in Texas and three rigs in Louisiana. Interestingly, New Mexico has five new rigs for operating for a total of 111. New Mexico now shows an annual increase of 6.7%, which is far above the uh, many of the other states because Texas is down 22.9%. Oklahoma showing a drop of 25.4% year over year. Louisiana is down year over year, down 28.1%. And North Dakota is down 22%. On a base, basin, if you want to look at the year over year the activity or you know, drops in most cases, really, uh, Permian Basin down 10.2% over last year. Eagle Ford, Texas, Texas's second largest basin, down 21.5%. The Haynesville Basin, which straddles the uh, Texas and Louisiana uh, state lines down 45.5%, and that would certainly uh, measures up uh, when we mentioned before about the rigs being down in Texas and Louisiana. Uh, the Williston Basin in North Dakota down 19%, and Marcellus down 25%. The current price of WTI crude oil as of April 8th is $86.91 a barrel. That's a few dollars from our last report and well over the annual average right now of $77.97 per barrel. Energy industry observers attribute some of the increases to concerns over the situation in Israel and Gaza and other tensions in that region. There's also talk of perhaps being some trouble with pricing if uh, Iran and Russia ever got together and decided to do any kind of a boycott. Economists like to call copper pricing Dr. Copper because it's the leading economic indicator for future activity since it's used in so many industries. The construction industry is among the leading markets for copper because of its use in wiring cable and plumbing pipe. As of April the 5th, copper is sitting at $4.24 per pound. That's up about 20 cents per pound since our last report. Copper topped the $4 mark on March 13th, and it was the first time it went above $4 in about a year, it certainly seems to be sitting pretty happy at that level and I imagine we'll stay at there for a bit going forward. Now let's take a look at the electrical stocks the publicly held companies of manufacturers, distributors, some of the big box stores and contractors. A lot of activity in the market. There were some definitely some companies that a lot better than others. The market overall was, was pretty de decent in the first quarter, although that's been some minor slowdown in the uh, last couple of weeks. Let's take a look. We had quite a few publicly held manufacturers, distributors, and contractors that are involved in the electrical market uh, that were up over 20%. Uh, what really struck out very quickly is that since uh, January 2nd, the three stocks with the largest increases were all contracting companies. Uh, MCOR, very large business in electrical, Comfort Systems, also electrical, and IES Holdings, which is a pure play in electrical. Uh, MCOR was up 67% since January 2nd, Comfort Systems up 56.3%, and IES Holdings up 56.2%. Uh, the number four company in terms of an increase since uh, since the beginning of the year is G. Uh, we'll be talking a, a little bit in a few minutes about the how G has spun off uh, two of its divisions in the, its power business and aerospace division. Um, Eaton Corp's also having a great year up 30.6%. Curity Brands up 30.5%. And Ven Electric up 28.9%. Another company with a fairly large con electrical contracting business in the utility area, MDU Resources Group, up 28.7%. Uh, Hubble Incorporated, up, also up 28%. Mastec, up 93.8%. That's a contractor. Uh, Encore Wire, uh, up about 23.8%. Now another wire company, up 23.7%. Nexons, uh, Granger, up 23.3%. And another contractor, uh, Quanta Services, up 22.9%. Uh, finishing up our list, Dialyte up 20.8% and Fastenal up 20%. Uh, we have the complete list of our electrical marketing stock index is available through electrical marketing every quarter. I take a look at all the uh, stocks that we track and try to do some analysis of that. Uh, the list is uh, the electrical stock index is available for $99 as part of an annual subscription to electrical marketing. When you look at the overall indexes, you can see when we reached that group of stocks from the last slide, they're up 20%. Look at how they compare to the uh, th three or four, if you want to include the Russell of the major indexes, how they were doing since January 2nd. Uh, Dow Jones, 4.8% gain. S&P was up 10.5%, and this is all through uh, April 1st. Uh, the NASDAQ, very heavy on the tech side, up 10.7%. And the small cap stocks, uh, which reflect uh, in the Russell 2000 there, 3.6%. Uh, some of the companies with the uh, some of the largest uh, decreases for, uh, during the quarter, 
3M down 14.7%. Little Fuse, not down 9.6%. Yeah, you know, for many, many years, really, Little Fuse has been one of the faster growing uh, of the uh, publicly held with a large electrical footprint. Zumtable in the lighting business down 8.2%. Rockwell down, shares down 7.5% for the quarter. Signify also saw a fairly slight decline for the quarter of 5.3%. MSC Industrial Direct, the distributor, doing a lot of online business, down 4.5%. Orion Energy Systems, down 2.6%. The electronics distributor, Avnet, down 0.8%. Uh, Rexel, down 0.2%. Generic holding steady for since January 2nd. And Wesco is up 0.8%. Uh, Wesco has had some nice increases. It seems to be taking a bit of a breather in recent weeks and maybe over the past month or two. There was a lot of excitement on Wall Street early last week when GE officially spun off its aerospace and power divisions. Uh, the one of most interest is the uh, GE Vernova. So it's basically going to be a new stock that will focus on GE's uh, gas turbine business, its power business, particularly in the wind and renewables, and also a very large piece of the business, which is uh, electrification, which will do everything involved with the grid from the, the products for specifically for the grid and also a very large software element. Let's take a look at all this. Uh, G Vernova is going to be a very large business. It's not necessarily uh, the type of business that we'll see a lot on uh, stock products or on distributor shelves, but in the anything anyone involved with the utility business or on utility projects will be uh, very interested in that. Um, if you take a look at the, let's take a look at it going back to the uh, power business, which it will have about 17.4% uh, in revenues last year. Its wind business about 9.8 billion in uh, revenue last year. And it's electrification business, about 64.4%. So you take that all together and it's somewhere so just over, uh, they're looking at guidance for this year, revenue over 30, 34 to 35 billion. Uh, they're looking at adjusted EBT uh, margins and mid, mid to single digit. Now they are looking at uh, cash flow almost right from the start for this year, looking at 700 million to 1.1 billion in uh, cash flow. So very interesting footprint there. The uh, power business includes not only the gas turbines, it has some modular nuclear power in there as well. Uh, wind, uh, kind of a mix of the onshore and offshore. G is a very big player in the, in the large turbines there. We've talked a bit about some of the challenges that the offshore uh, wind farms have in the U.S. right now with getting permitted. Some, some of the larger players have uh, backed out. But if we take a little bit longer term look at the uh, offshore wind market, it's, it's going to be it's going to be big, and there's a lot of onshore uh, connections to that market that will affect the uh, directly affect the, the folks in the electrical wholesaling industry as they bring the power ashore. They put a lot of cable. There's a lot of um, the different uh, staging areas where, by the ports where the all the equipment is going to be in and out. A lot of a lot of work around there. There's also training facilities and wind that are also very big. Uh, I'm, I'm particularly interested, I guess, in what uh, all this electrification business is going to mean. We've talked so much about the need for the uh, grid to be modernized, to be hardened against cybersecurity, and also to have it do a better job of tying in with all the renewable resources that are going to be in there. And GE is going to be involved with all of it, uh, both on the you know, specific products, whether it's some of the uh, you know, large, large uh, utility type of products, but also a lot, quite a bit of software as well. So it's going to be very interesting to see where this all ends up for a G. This wraps up our podcast for today. Special thanks to the folks from Champion Fiberglass for sponsoring the Today's Electrical Economy podcast series in 2024. Please contact me if there's any other type of economic data that you'd like us to cover in these podcasts. And also I mentioned about electrical marketing. If you want any more information on our stock index, I can give you an example of how we cover that. You just contact me at uh, jlucy at endeavorb2b.com or at 913-461-7679. Again, those are subscription to electrical marketing. I uh, go for $99 per year. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about that uh, GG for Nova deal, that, that company, I did a little bit of analysis. An article is posted on both the electrical wholesaling and electrical marketing uh, websites. And I think give you a little more idea of what's going on with that company and the potential impact it could have on the electrical landscape. Our next presentation will be on April 22nd, 2024. And until then, be happy, be healthy. Look forward to talking with you in two weeks. Take care.